I'll talk a little bit about my career as a writer first, and then I'll talk a little bit about how I came to write uh, Black Snake's Path. And then I'm going to read uh, a couple sequences from the novel, one uh, about Miami courtship rituals, and the other about uh, one part of uh, an important battle that's been totally forgotten called Harmer's Defeat, uh, which took place uh, within uh, 15 miles of here, but no one knows exactly where it took place. And so one of the things I think might be fun is, is to at least let you know that there's an important historical mystery out there in, in your terrain. It's just over in the southwest corner of your <coughs> township, not quite uh, in your county, uh, but very, very close. Uh, so, so we know approximately where this battle took place, but we don't know uh, the full details. And I'll go into that later, and, and then I'll, I'll talk a little bit more after I've read about Harmer's defeat. I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the rest of Wells' career, and then uh, I'll be open to some question and answer. <coughs> okay, so uh, my name is William Heath. I was born in Youngstown, Ohio, went to Hiram College. Uh, and I have a PhD in American Studies from Case Western Reserve. Uh, a PhD in American Studies means that I, I sort of specialize in both literature and history. And so I feel very comfortable writing uh, literary essays and I also write uh, history essays. Uh, next year I'm going to bring out another book about Wells fully documented with the University of Oklahoma Press which will be a straight history of his life and his, and his times. Uh, I, uh, I began my teaching career at, at Kenyon College in Ohio, which has a very famous uh, literary tradition. Uh, and I began, I, I've taught all my life, I should say, in English departments, even though I've taught interdisciplinary courses uh, frequently. Uh, Kenyon was where John Crow Ransom was, a famous poet, and, and a lot of major authors came to study with him. Robert Lowell is one, uh, Randall Jarrell taught there, uh, some of these names may ring bells, Eel Doctorow uh, went there, William Gass, the comedian Jonathan Winters, the actor Paul Newman, and so forth. They, anyway, they had, for a small college, they had a very rich tradition, and lots of writers passed through, and so that's when I really started to write, and I became a poet at that point. Uh, this is in the late 60s, and for the next 10 years or so, I, I wrote poetry, published about 100 poems, um, the best of them are collected in this little book called The, the Walking Man. Uh, so I started out as a, as a poet, and um, after teaching at um, Kenyon, I taught at Transylvania College in Lexington, Kentucky uh, in the early 70s. Uh, out of that eventually came this novel, Devil Dancer, which is about the shooting of a racehorse in 1972. Not a horse while racing, but a horse while standing in, in stud at a stud farm. Uh, and it's a sort of a neo-noir crime novel, but it's not a, a sort of normal genre novel where you just a body every five chapters and that kind of thing. Uh, it's, it, I like to think at least it's a, it's a very literary uh, crime novel with a kind of existential dimension to it, and it's based on a lot of uh, in-depth knowledge I gained when I lived in Kentucky at, at that time. So if you're interested in horse farms and, and uh, crime and uh, it, it, I was just thinking that much of my career I've been a historical novelist, and this is not particularly a historical novel, but one of the ironies is that the Lexington I described of 1972 is mostly gone. Uh, and so in effect I, I, I realize in retrospect I'm writing about Lost World. When I now go back to Lexington, and I'll be going back again in May for another book fair there because you know, this book is popular in Kentucky as my Wells books is popular in Indiana. Uh, I realize how much of that world is, is now lost. Uh, anyway, the, the first novel I published, which uh, took about uh, eight years to research, was this novel called The Children Bob Moses Led. And it's about uh, Freedom Summer in Mississippi, 1964. Uh, and Bob Moses was the African American leader of Freedom Summer. But uh, hundreds of college students, mainly white, mainly from the North, went to Mississippi, which everyone knew at the time was the toughest state of all. Uh, and they worked for voter registration and they taught in freedom schools. Uh, you may have heard of the case of three of them were killed the first weekend they, they went down, the Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner murders. 
Uh, it became the most sensational crime case of uh, 1964, and the federal presence was very large in Mississippi for the rest of that summer. Ironically, the three people getting killed probably saved uh, dozens of others from getting killed because the fact that the federal government uh, showed such concern probably made the Klan sort of decide that we better not kill any more, more people this year, uh, which didn't say they stopped completely. But, but those were the only three of the workers who were killed, although many were beaten and jailed and harassed and so forth and so on. Uh, and my novel is an account of that. There are two narrators. One is Bob Moses himself, and this is Bob Moses uh, addressing a, a group of followers that summer. Uh, and the other is a narrator named Tom Morton, who is uh, my age and from Ohio, and so I used some autobiographical details to sort of get him to Mississippi. But I wasn't in Freedom Summer myself, uh, so after that he is very much a fictional character and he's on his own. Uh, and Tom Morton does a lot of the things that the Freedom Summer volunteers did. He teaches at a Freedom School and he works on voter registration, and, he's at a, and he goes on to the Democratic Convention in 1964 in Atlantic City. Uh, this novel won a national award when it, it came out and was later selected by Time magazine as one of the 11 best books ever written about the African-American experience. So it has a certain amount of cachet, you might say. And so the New South Books has brought it out now on a 20th, a 20th anniversary edition to commemorate that this is the 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer 1964 in Mississippi. Uh, this book came out in 1995. And um, I then had to turn, you know, I don't like to repeat myself, and so I wanted to turn my attention to something else. But I, I sort of got addicted to research. I think the historian in me came out. Uh, the way I researched this book, by the way, is the Wisconsin Historical Society has a really incredible collection of the letters and diaries and journals and newspaper articles about those hundreds of people uh, from, the, from the north who went south. And so I was able, uh, for years, I, j I just went up there and hit the Xerox machine from 8 to 5 every day, Xeroxing all these letters and diaries, etc., etc., and then take it home and pour over it for a couple more years. And so even though Tom Morton is fictitious, you know, the kinds of things he does are the kinds of things that volunteers did. So I, I became interested in this idea of writing historical fiction that actually is, uh, I like to tell myself well, in my broad moments better than history books because you, you get into the history in, in more detail. A, a novelist can tell you what the weather was like and what people were doing in their private lives as well as their public lives. And for me, in Freedom Summer, what was so interesting is what's going to happen when all these white northern college students go down to Mississippi and live in these, these uh, essentially black communities with the white community ready to kill them if they get a chance. And what kind of things are going to happen as, as these people interact? Uh, and so I tell the private story of Freedom Summer as well as the public story. Uh, and with the Moses narration, uh, there's another great archive in Atlanta. The Martin Luther King papers have the, what are called the SNCC papers, the, the group that Moses led, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And uh, one of the guys at SNCC insisted that all the activists, if ever you're arrested or, or harassed or anything difficult happens to you, you have to go home and write a report about it. And this is unusual because usually politi political activists don't go home and write reports about their activity. I mean, they're, they're, they're people who want to be active. Uh, but J James Foreman was the guy who sort of insisted on this. So there's an incredible paper trail, in other words, about Freedom Summer, which I was able to tap into. Uh, I might add that uh, my own credentials as a civil rights worker are, are relatively uh, small, but I was in the March on Washington, and I did hear Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, and I did do some canvassing, so I had a, a little bit of personal experience that, that I could draw on. Anyway, so I wanted to do another uh, historical work, but something quite different. Uh, I'm from Ohio, as I say. My dad was a very big genealogy guy, and so he had traced our family all the way back to the first William Heath, who came to Roxbury, Massachusetts in 1632, and traced the family out to Ohio, where there was someone named Cap Heath, who was one of the early surveyors in the 1820s. Uh, and then my people became farmers in uh, northwestern uh, Ohio, in the Illyria, the Lane, the Illyria, I'm, 
I'm going to mispronounce Lorraine, <laughs> Elyria, Lorraine area of, uh, South, of uh, Ohio. Uh, my father went to Oberlin College, and so you know they were originally from that terrain. And then uh, I grew up in a suburb of, of Youngstown. So I, I had this interest in uh, the the history of, of our own region, you know, the old Northwest, which is Ohio, Indiana, Michigan, Illinois, and Wisconsin. That was the old Northwest. And um, I had come across mention of William Wells in a couple of history books. And he always struck me as, this is an absolutely fascinating figure. His life is comparable to Daniel Boone or Davy Crockett or um, Buffalo Bill or any frontiersman you ever heard of. And yet, uh, William Wells, you know, is, is not, shall we say, a household name. And so I thought, and, and this guy's story is perfect to telling the story of the Old Northwest because uh, he literally was everywhere that mattered from this period, from about 1770 to uh, 1812 when he died. So let me recapitulate his story uh, uh, fairly briefly, I hope. Uh, Wells' uh, people were from Virginia. They moved to uh, western Pennsylvania uh, around uh, 1767, 68. Uh, Wells was born on a place called Jacobs Creek in 1770. Uh, in 1779, uh, his family flatboated down the Ohio, as so many pioneers did, to, uh, to Louisville. And, and they were among the very first people to settle Louisville. They, they lived in an area right behind Louisville called Beargrass <laughs> Creek, where a lot of people settled. Uh, Wells, his mother, died uh, probably of uh, the flux or the influenza you know, uh, uh, around uh, a couple years later. Uh, his father was killed in what's called the Long Run Massacre in 1782, another unknown event that I was able to recreate and figure out in some detail. Uh, and then Wells was captured by the Miami in 1784 outside Louisville by a war party, part Delaware, part Miami. Uh, they brought the captives up to probably about Muncie, Indiana, uh, a place called uh, Chestnut Tree Place at the time. And um, the Delaware captives took the other three boys, but Wells, who had probably been captured by a, a, a Miami Indian called the Soldier, was brought to Snakefish Town, which is up the Eel River, about six miles from Logansport on the West Bank. Uh, and there he was adopted by the Soldier's brother <coughs> and the village chief called the Porcupine. So Wells, at about the age of 14, uh, has been uh, uh, captured and adopted by the Miami. And then for the next several years, uh, he, uh, he acculturated, he went native, as anthropologists say, he became a Miami. Uh, and so uh, <coughs> you, you, learn all the, you, you learn all the things the boys learn, and then uh, at a certain age you go on what is called a vision quest, uh, where you fast and go out on your own and you come back and receive a new name. Wells was originally called um, uh, Carrot Top, uh, apparently for his red hair, although there's a Miami story that apparently was because he craved uh, some carrot soup because he was so hungry when he was captured. I, it's hard to know the truth of this. But apparently his, his vision quest name was Black Snake. And so he became Black Snake, at, at least I, I think there's a good case that he became Black Snake. Again, some of this is not carved in stone, uh, and he, uh, he then went on the warpath with the Miami. This was at a time, of course, when settlers were beginning to pour down the Ohio, uh, hundreds if not thousands of boats, and of course the Indians north of the Ohio were panicked, you know, that they knew that unless we can stop this incredible immigration, we're, we're doomed. Uh, there is a, one story, I mean this story is told by Wells' worst enemy, but I think it might be true that Wells at least once served as a decoy to lure flatboats to the northern shore of the Ohio so that they could be ambushed. Certainly the, the Indians were ambushing flatboats coming down the Ohio. This is around in 1788-89. Uh, this was happening very frequently. And, and th there's no way of knowing how many people were killed in this way because no one was signing up in... in uh, uh, 
in Pittsburgh and saying I'm going down to Ohio, uh, and then signing up in Louisville saying I made it. You know, so so we really don't know how many people were killed in in this way, but uh, it's safe to say uh, probably several hundred over the course of a five-year period. There, the most intense period was 1786 to about uh, 1792 uh, when the flatboats were being ambushed. And Wells also no doubt went on what raids into Kentucky, uh, picking off isolated cabins, that kind of thing. Uh, the American government, of course, was the Constitution came out in uh, 1787 and Washington became president and the Americans be, tried to impose peace treaties on the Indians of the Northwest. The, they claimed by right of conquest that they now own the Northwest Territory. And the Indians, of course, were having none of it, even though some could be induced to sign treaties. Uh, basically, uh, the, the vast majority of Indians knew these treaties were imposed and were fraudulent. And so they were determined to resist. And one of the centers of resistance, if not the center, was Kikionga, present day Fort Wayne. And the, the, the war chief of the Miami was Little Turtle, whose village is very close to here in this county down on the Eel River. Uh, so Washington told a General Harmer uh, to come up and uh, sort of teach these Indians a lesson. They were, he, they were referred to as the banditti, even though we're talking about several thousand in, Indian warriors. Uh, and so Harmer, with about 1,200 men, uh, more militia than regulars, uh, began to march up toward Kikionga, which again is, is Fort Wayne. Uh, and they arrived at, at about, um, what is it, about October 17th, 18th, something like that, uh, 1790. Uh, the Kentucky militia and, uh, well, the, and the expedition went out one day looking, the Indians had, had burned the town and abandoned it. And so a, a couple hundred Kentuckians and militia or, or soldiers went out looking for them on the 18th and did not find them. Uh, and the, um, <laughs> and uh, a, a general, uh, a Kentucky militia guy named Hardin uh, thought that the Kentuckians had been shamed by not finding them. So he said, I'm going to go tomorrow and we'll find them. Uh, and so about 200 militia and about 60 um, U.S. Army guys headed out on the 19th of October, 1790. Several militia dropped out along the way, and so probably less than 200 um, got up to around the Eel River area. Roughly, they were following Route 33, uh, which is, you know, you folks know your geography better than I do. And, and at about the Eel River, uh, I believe on the south bank and uh, if you're coming from Fort Wayne to the left of the of 33, although the history books have placed it to the just to the right, a place called Heller's Corners. But uh, before Heller's Corners, I don't think the historians knew there was something called Old Heller's Corners, which was on the left side. Uh, and and I think probably it's the left side that that matters. Uh, anyway, Little Turtle ambushed this crew and uh, killed about 60 on the ground. Uh, and everyone else ran into panic back to Fort Wayne. And so at this point, both the, the Kentuckians felt shamed and Harbor was very upset. Uh, and so the, the, they said, well, we'll burn the towns and we'll leave. Uh, and so they did that and then they marched away a day. And then they said, you know, everyone said, this is, the, we'll never do, we have to get our victory. And so they convinced Harmer to come back to Kikionga with about 400 men. And it says, some of the Indians will have wandered back into town and we'll kill them and take their scalps and so forth. So um, Harmer came up to uh, present day Fort Wayne and divided his force into three. One came sort of straight into town across the river and the two other forces sort of looped around this way. Uh, Little Turtle was not fully prepared for this happening, but as soon as he realized what was happening, he deployed the Indians he had as quickly as he could 
and called for reinforcement because the Indians were not far away. Uh, and so snipers began to pick off the troops as they crossed the river, and then Indians coming in from the Delaware and Shawnee villages began to engage them on the flanks, uh, and then the main force came right into the Miami town, and Little Turtle with his warriors and with Shawnee reinforcements uh, began picking them off, and then a very fierce battle took place uh, along the St. Joseph's River. There were about two or three stages to this battle. But um, the, the Americans, again, were very badly defeated, leaving about 120 dead in the field. And they retreated back to Cincinnati, claiming a great victory. Uh, Washington was not deceived. Washington understood fully well that, that they had suffered a grievous defeat. And so to punish the Indians the next year, uh, he sent up St. Clair with another force, uh, not much larger, about 1,500 in all, and St. Clair sent about 300 back uh, to chase deserters. So he only had about 1,200 on the ground at present Fort Recovery. And Little Turtle and uh, the Confederated warriors uh, attacked at dawn, striking first the militia camp to make them panic and race back into the main camp. And then the Indians, the Indians characteristically attacked in what was called a half moon formation. So they came right at the militia camp and panicked them this way. And then they circled around the whole camp and began picking everybody off. And St. Clair, to try to break out, sent charges out into the Indians, and the Indians would withdraw and let them charge out into the countryside and then the counterattack on three sides. Uh, anyway, this was the biggest victory the Indians ever won against the U.S. Army anywhere. Three times bigger than Custer's last stand, to give you some perspective. Uh, Black Snake was fighting on the side of Little Turtle. Uh, at this point, uh, he had married uh, Little Turtle's uh, daughter, Sweet Breeze. This was his second wife. I'm, I'll come around to the first wife in, in, in a minute. Uh, and Black Snake and his snipers were picking off the people at the cannons, and uh, they did devastating work. The cannons were worthless in that battle. So uh, about 700 dead on the field, about 650 of them troops, and about 50 of them camp followers. Uh, that same year, I'll, I'll come to the, the first wife now. That same year, a man named James Wilkinson led a raid up to Snakefish Town, where Wells had been raised. And he had married in Snakefish Town and had a young son. And Wilkinson's raid caught the Indians by surprise. The warriors were elsewhere. And he captured about 30 people and brought them back to Cincinnati. Uh, Wells, was in, in, Wells then tried to uh, get involved in the, in the negotiations to free his family and the other prisoners. He went first to Vincennes, and then down to Louisville, and then up to Cincinnati. And in Cincinnati, he met with General Putnam, General Ruf Rufus Putnam. And Putnam realized right away that uh, Wells was unique. I mean, here's someone who knew everything we don't know. He knew the Indian languages, he knew the terrain, he knew the countryside, uh, et cetera. And, and so Putnam made him a very generous offer to come over to the U.S. side. Um, and Wells agreed to do that and agreed to negotiate a treaty at Vincennes that freed the prisoners. And then Putnam hired him some more to go up to the Maumee and spy on the Indian councils that were being held there in 1792-1793. The Indians had won their great victories, and now they had to decide, well, what do we do with it? Do we, uh, do we make some concessions and sign a treaty? Or do we push on and try for another big victory and so forth? The, the Indians wanted the Ohio River boundary. And of course, that was the clearest boundary of all. But uh, Americans had already settled north of the Ohio at Marietta and um, in Cincinnati. And, and there, were, there were sort of uh, renegade settlers all along the, uh, the northern shore. And so the, the Americans simply were not going to negotiate that away, uh, even though they have been badly beaten. So when the Indians realized that um, their terms were, were going to be rejected, um, then you know, they knew they were going to have to fight again. Wells, at the end of this, in 1793, went back and reported to Anthony Wayne, who had 
been put in charge of the U.S. Army after Harmer and St. Clair had failed. And Wayne again realized William Wells is this exceptional person, and he hired him as, as the head of a special unit of scouts, or spies as they were called at the time, who were made up of other people who had been captured by the Indians, or very, very experienced frontiersmen. Uh, and so when Wayne began his march up uh, into Indian country, he wasn't ambushed uh, the way Harmer and St. Clair were, because Wells and his scouts are, are out ahead of him, uh, making that largely impossible, and taking prisoners along the way who are reporting on the enemy movements and so forth. Uh, and Wayne is very carefully and systematically marching his way up there. Uh, Wells is very badly wounded in the wrist uh, in a, a sort of daredevil engagement right uh, before the Battle of Fallen Timbers. He and a, a couple scouts ride into a small Delaware camp uh, pretending to still be Indians. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, and they want to sort of just have uh, quiz the people in the camp about what the Indians are feeling and thinking. But one of the Indians in the camp, at the Delaware camp, recognizes one of the people, whether it's Wells or someone else, and there's a little firefight that ensues. And both Wells and another man are, are hit as they ride off. Uh, and Wells is hit the wrist. So he, he no longer can fight. But apparently he was still with Wayne. Uh, at Fallen Timbers, and apparently, this is one of the things I, I found in my research, that apparently Wells advised Wayne to not attack on the day he had planned to attack, but to wait another day. And he, he said, the Indians are fasting, and that by tomorrow morning they're going to be very hungry. And so if you wait a day and attack the next morning, you'll, th their lines will be depleted. And that is exactly what happened, is that Wells wait, or Wayne waited a day, attacked the following day, and there were less than 500 Indians in position to fight him. He had uh, two, 3,000 men with him, uh, and through a bayonet charge, they were able to break the Indian ranks fairly easily. There weren't a whole lot of casualties at this battle, but the Indians were routed, and they ran back to the British Fort, Fort Miami's, and said, let us in protect us, which is just a mile or two behind the lines, and the British shut the gates against them. And so that, uh, the Indians never forgave that uh, on the part of the British. The following year, uh, at the Treaty of Greenville, which you may have heard of, which was the crucial treaty that, that ceded most of Ohio, except for a little corner up there in the south, in the northwest corner, Wells is the negotiator uh, between Wayne and Little Turtle. Little Turtle was the only <laughs> Indian chief who really contested the Treaty of Greenville. And this famous portrait that hangs in the capital of the Ohio building, of the Ohio Capitol, uh, has Little Turtle here and Wayne here, and in the middle with his arms spread out is, is William Wells interpreting. And what's interesting here, of course, is Little Turtle is his father-in-law, and Wayne, uh, he revered as a father, and he's talking both languages and because these guys were arguing very vehemently, and Wells is, is doing the arguing for both sides. He's the one that's actually doing the talking, uh, in effect. So this epitomizes uh, why Wells is so interesting, is he's in the middle of these two worlds, trying to negotiate these worlds, and of course, uh, that, uh, that is doomed in, in the long run, even in the short run, there isn't much time left, you might say. Uh, for much of the rest of William Wells' life, he was the Indian agent at Fort Wayne. And uh, he gets involved in the civilization program, and he's the guy who sounds the early warnings about Tecumseh and, and the Shawnee Prophet. Uh, he becomes, as I think I say in the novel, the best hated man in the territory because the white people didn't trust him uh, because he's too Indian, the Indians didn't trust him because he's too white. Uh, Tecumseh and the prophet are enraged at him because he's sounding the alarm, uh, and on and on and on. Uh, I mean, that, so Wells becomes this extremely controversial figure. And, and Wells, uh, obviously, was, was a great man of action. I mean, he was a very gifted lawyer. Uh, I don't think he was a particularly gifted bureaucrat. <laughs> and so he's caught in the midst of all this stuff, and uh, it doesn't always go well. He's actually fired by the government in 1809. And in part to get his credit back with the government, he helps Harrison negotiate 
the Fort Wayne Treaty of 1809, which is the treaty the Indians hated the most and played the biggest role in getting them angry. Uh, ironically, Wells helped Harrison sign all the treaties that, by which Harrison got uh, much of Indiana, Illinois, etc. I mean, Harrison uh, grabbed a huge amount of land in, in those treaties. Wells helped Harrison with most of those treaties, but after he had done it, he usually had second thoughts and regrets and encouraged the Indians to protest the treaties that he had helped to, to sign. So you can see why Wells is, again, the man in the middle. And obviously, as, as you read about Wells, you know, you can't simply plant your feet and I'm for the Miami or I'm for the, the, the white people, you know, that, that, that he makes you sort of see the pros and cons all the time, which I think is very, very valuable uh, as a figure. Wells sort of got his job back. Harrison knew he needed him. And so he kept encouraging the government, don't fire this guy completely. He's still of use to me. He knows more about the Indians than anyone else. Uh, and so Wells became kind of sub-agent for a couple of years. Then when the War of 1812 broke out, uh, Wells's niece uh, was married to the commander at Fort Dearborn in Chicago. And when the United States declared war in 1812, which they did in an extremely sloppy manner, without preparing for the war, without funding it, uh, etc., and it, it, from our point of view here, without telling the West <laughs> that war was coming. Uh, and so the British knew we were at war before the Americans knew we were at war. And the result was that Fort Mackinac fell right away at the start of the war. And the Potawatomi surrounded Fort Dearborn, present-day Chicago, uh, at, the, at the start of the war. And so Wells realized that that garrison was in grave jeopardy. And he and 30 Miami warriors went out to try to negotiate something or, or save them if he could, etc. And so Wells met with the Potawatomi chiefs, some of whom were friends of his and were friendly. Others were enemies of him and hated his guts, to put it mildly. And the negotiations, shall we say, did not, did not go really well. They thought they had a deal. They thought that the Indians were going to let them evacuate the fort. But the Indians thought that part of the deal was that the, the gunpowder and weaponry would be turned over to them as well. But the, the people in the fort, and, and probably Wells included, there, there are sources going both ways on this, uh, said, we can't do that. And so they poured the gunpowder down the well and they broke the guns that they weren't taking with them. And the Indians became aware of that. They smelled the gunpowder. Uh, and they also threw the whiskey down the well too, which didn't go well. Uh, so when the garrison marched out of Fort Dearborn, they were allowed to march about two miles. And this was not just soldiers. This was women and children and the, the, and the uh, French, Amer uh, French Indian traders who were there. About 95 people in all, maybe 50 of them military. Uh, the Potawatomi attacked, uh, surprised them. This is a kind of sand dune country at that time. So they were along the beach and there were dunes and the Potawatomi were behind the dunes and the wagon train. There were three wagons with, pulling the supplies, women and children. Uh, the Potawatomi attacked and um, killed about half of them and took the other half prisoner. Wells was killed in, in the fight. Everyone agrees that he fought with incredible bravery. Uh, he was shot several times. Uh, his horse fell on top of him, so he's lying on the ground, pinned by his horse. And there are various versions of what happens next. I think that the truest version is a Potawatomi version, where one of the friendly chiefs that Wells knew uh, came up to him, and Wells said, Father, I want to live. And the chief said, my son, you can. But at that point, um, a couple of the Potawatomi chiefs that hated him came up and shot him. And also, uh, if you're ready for gory details, they, they took out his heart and ate it and chopped off his head. So uh, he came to a most gruesome uh, of endings. And of course, he's considered sort of the hero martyr of the, that Fort Dearborn massacre. Wells Avenue in Chicago is named for him, just as Wells Street and Spy Run and Fort Wayne are, uh, are named for William Wells. I went ahead and told the full story of Wells. Uh, now, let me read an excerpt or two, if you don't mind, and then we'll do some questions. I think we're, we're okay for time. Uh, 
one of the things that was, are, are, are we fine if I can't wait for a few more minutes? Uh, actually, I, I guess I shouldn't move from the camera. I'll, I'll stay here. Um, one of the great challenges of writing about Wells was about the, the first third of my novel is about how Wells became a Miami. And needless to say, he wasn't writing an account of today, you know, here's how I became Miami, that, that it, it took several years of research to figure out what would have happened. And I, I read all the captivity narratives from, uh, and, and the Woodland Indian captivities are fairly similar. So people captured by the Shawnee or the Delaware, uh, it's not, it's very similar to what happens if you're captured by Miami. And what happens when someone is captured and, and learns to uh, want to stay with the Indians, which happened far more than the U.S. government or the civilization, the people in general were happy with. I mean, an awful lot of captives uh, went native, and, and when they were repatriated, didn't want to go. Uh, wanted to stay with the Indians. This happened more often than people realized. Uh, and, and Wells was, was one of them. So how does this come about? And of course, uh, what happens is you get immersed in the, in the culture. And, and it's a very gripping culture once, it, when it was stable. I mean, once it's all destabilized and the alcoholism takes over, et cetera, et cetera, it's not very pretty. But, but when it's coherent, it's coherent. It makes sense, you know, what they're doing. And it, it's more ritualized uh, than one might imagine. So uh, what I think I'll do is read a little sequence on, um, on courtship, because um, what happens after Wells is gone on the warpath? Uh, how do you marry? I mean, this was, I, I thought this was an interesting thing. I mean, how do you go about getting a wife? And, and it, it isn't just uh, me, Tarzan, you, Jane, come to, t come to my cave. You know, it's, it's actually fairly uh, elaborate. And so I sort of got intrigued with that and tried to recreate uh, the courtship experience. Uh, and so the, uh, the woman he's courting is named uh, Sweet Breeze, or, I'm sorry, is named Laughing Eyes. This is his first wife. And uh, the porcupine, again, is his adoptive father. And you're going to uh, meet someone called Kiss Me, who uh, was a homosexual. They called them uh, white faces or, or he she's. And uh, th they had their own place in Indian society. And they, uh, it was believed that they had uh, love magic and that they were people you would consult if you wanted to get married. So, so Kiss Me is going to play a role, and then I, th I think the other names will fall into place. Uh, so Wells has come back from the warpath, and he's got a scalp, and so now his parents want him to marry. Uh, he went out a boy, Two Lives said to the porcupine after the ceremonies. He came back a man. My son, the porcupine replied, resting his hand on Black Snake's shoulder and pulling aside the bearskin hung in the doorway, come smoke. No-Nos looked up as they entered the wigwam. Now you can marry, she said. No-Nos, I should say, is his adoptive mother. Uh, and she literally had her nose chopped off at one point, so that's why she's called No-Nos. Uh, holding two fingers together in the ear and smiling lewdly. Who will you choose? Don't rush him, the porcupine said. He has time. Maybe he does and maybe he does not, No-Nos asserted. Not if he wants who I think. What do you mean, Black Snake demanded. You are not the only one interested in Laughing Eyes, she hinted with a smirk of someone who knows a secret. Everyone agreed that Laughing Eyes was pretty and would make a good wife, but Black Snake had already considered the possibility that he might have rivals. He had noticed the way she looked at him when she didn't think he was looking, or did she? Wasn't that a sure sign, and wasn't he the son of a chief? Even in the flickering firelight of the lodge, No-Nos could see his face and read his thoughts. Have you slept with her? No, mother. Have you tried? Not yet. Do you know how? Of course. I am not so sure, No-Nos said skeptically. I will ask two lives to give you lessons. <laughs> this is an uncle. Uh, Black Snake found it perfectly normal to discuss his sex life with his mother, but bristled at the suggestion that he didn't know what he was doing. Hadn't he already slept with Thunderstruck, Brings Joy, and Missed at Dawn? A discreet promiscuity prevailed among the teenagers of the village. A boy would hide behind the trails the women took to cut and fetch firewood. When he saw a girl he desired walking alone, he would step out, take her by the wrist, and pull her gently into the bushes. If she resisted, he withdrew, but enough girls consented to keep the game lively. 
At night, boys would slip into the wigwams and wake the girls of their choice, who would welcome them or tell them to go away. A few bolder girls, like Brings Joy and Shadows on Treetops at Sunset, sought out their lovers, but most were an alluring combination of modesty and flirtatiousness. Laughing Eyes certainly had the knack to keep Black Snake guessing. He hadn't yet worked up his nerve to make his plea. Who, he asked no notice, what do you mean? Today I saw sweating, give, giving kiss me, a ruffled shirt and a feathered hat. Why? Black Snake sensed he knew the answer. Sweating resented Black Snake's accomplishments and blamed him for allowing Cold Feet to be killed by the rogue bear. Why do you think she's the best love talker in the village and makes the most powerful love potion? Because they were a blend of male and female forces, the he, she's, or white faces, were respected as persons with special powers, although they were also the butt of much joking. Kiss Me was often consulted as a matchmaker, sang and danced at major ceremonies, and did not lack for sexual partners among the boys and men, who sometimes made offers of marriage. A few white faces have been known to go on war parties, dressing as men once they left the village, but restricted to using only war clubs in battle. For the Miami, sex among teenagers was a private matter and considered essentially frivolous. But marriage was public, serious, and concerned everybody. Now that Black Snake and his friends had been on the warpath and brought back scalps, the whole village watched closely to see whom they chose to marry. Since it was taboo to select someone within your own clan, every wedding meant a new alliance of families and an increase of relatives. Two lives dutifully came by the next morning to make sure Black Snake understood the rudiments of lovemaking. After some ribald banter about whether or not his nephew was equipped for the job, Two Lies promptly sat on the ground with his knees up and demonstrated the preferred Miami method for enjoying sex out of doors in the day. Do this properly, he said, and she will ask for more. Then he got on his knees and explained how he wrapped his arms around his partner's lower back to hold her in place. This is the best way at night, he instructed, but you must only move in a careful and controlled manner. Why? If you become too excited, he replied with a salacious leer, the sleeping platform will collapse and everybody will wake up. <laughs> Finally, Two Lies insisted that as a Miami man and warrior, Black Snake must not overindulge his appetites. Too much sex would sap his strength. I know this is difficult, he added, because a woman of beauty like Laughing Eyes has great power. Black Snake smiled and nodded his head in agreement. By the way, Two Lies remarked, do you know why a woman wiggles when she walks? Tell me, uncle. And this is an authentic Miami story. Uh, it happened like this. When the gray hair first created the world, he made a man and gave, a, gave him a dog as a companion. He thought that they would hunt together and be always happy. But before long, the man became depressed and hung his head and moped around and lost interest in the hunt. The dog, meanwhile, became more nervous and excited, yelping and wagging his tail to prevent his master from sleeping all the time and letting them starve. The great horse the great hare saw that this would not do, so he decided one day to make a woman. He took a rib from the sleeping man and set it aside to ponder what shape she should have. Sensing he would soon have a rival and feeling terribly hungry, the dog grabbed the rib in his teeth and, tail wagging, ran away with it. The great hare had to chase that dog for a long distance before he finally caught him and took the rib back and made a woman. All the time he was shaping her, the dog was by his side with his tongue hanging and his tail wagging. When the gray hair had finished, he asked the man what he thought of the woman. I like her, the man said. She lifts my heart and makes life worth living, and I especially like the way she wiggles when she walks. The gray hair was pleased when he heard these words, and I think the dog was too, because he still wags his tail. <coughs> Black Snake laughed at the tail and thanked two lives, admitting that his uncle had taught him a few things. His first sexual experience with Brings Joy had been a furtive and hurried affair in the bushes that left both flustered and unsatisfied. When he gave, a, gave her a necklace of blue beads the next day, she threw them on the ground. <coughs> Knowing that he loved another, the two other girls he had slept with turned their attention elsewhere. <coughs> now he had a rival for Laughing Eyes' affection in sweating, aided by a white face's potent magic. That afternoon, he sought out Kiss Me, who was gathering wood with some other women. Have you found a husband yet? Black Snake blurted out. Uh, 
Still looking, Kiss Me answered in the lisping, sing-song, almost babyish voice that Miami women used when they were in playful mood. How about me? Too short, Kiss Me, please. Why did Sweating give you presents yesterday? He wanted some love medicine to make his dreams come true. What dreams? You know, laughing eyes. If you want her, I can touch her heart and fill her with desire. She will tear off her clothes to come to you. Were she on a distant island, she would come. Is that what you already promised Sweaty? <coughs> what I promise I perform, I have the power. Perhaps I could give you something. What do you have that I want? Blacksnick handed over the compass he had taken from Filson, the surveyor he had killed. Oh, I do like that, Kiss Me exclaimed, slipping it inside her dress. I will bring you what you need. Blacksnake thanked Kiss Me and turned to go, but felt a restraining hand on his arm. Why not marry me, Kiss Me asked in a way that might almost have been sincere. I will not only cook for you, but hunt as well. Can you kill a deer if he stands still in my path? I want laughing eyes. I am good, I can make a man happy. That is what they say. What you hear is true. You should give me a try. Kiss Me insisted mischievously. You might find you like it. I have made my choice. Look for me after the dance tomorrow evening. I know what will charm her. The young men and women of Snakefish Town spent most of the next day preparing for the stomp dance. Black Snake used a clam shell to pull any facial stubble he could find, combed his hair, oiled it with bear grease, and selected his finest calico shirt and linen leggings. Laughing Eyes plaited her glossy black hair and adorned it with eelskin wrap. She fastened hundreds of silver brooches and brass thimbles to her sleek doeskin dress and little bells to her ankles so that she jiggled when she walked and applied a daub of vermilion to her cheeks and eyelids. She wore her finest earrings and her moccasins were exquisitely decorated with beadwork. The frolic began at dusk and went on for hours. Usually the women danced in an inner ring with the men circling around them, but sometimes they would interweave and find individual partners. Although a few bold souls whispered wanted words when they had a chance, the pounding drums and constant movement permitted little chance to talk. The spice of the courtship was in the way bodies swayed and eyes beguiled. Black Snake positioned himself behind laughing eyes as often as possible and strived to match her rhythms with his own, but so did Sweating and a few other potential rivals. Whenever Black Snake paused, uh, passed by her, he put as much meaning in his glance as he could, which more than once made her cinnamon brown face break into a smile that displayed her white teeth. Was that a good sign, or did she think him a silly, love-struck fool? When the drums stopped well after midnight, a few couples wandered off into the dark, while most returned to their wigwams. Laughing eyes seemed to tarry a moment at the edge of the dancing ground, but before Black Snake could muster the resolve to approach her, she turned and walked slowly away. At that moment, Kisley, whose dancing had won praise all evening, came up to him. Look what I have for you, he said, holding out a small block bark torch. I could have made that myself, Black Snake replied scornfully. Not this one, Kiss Me insisted. I use specially prepared strips from trees known only to me. It has an aroma no woman can resist. Go to her tonight and you will see what I say is true. Black Snake grasped the torch and strolled, as if he had no destination in mind, toward Laughing Eyes' wigwam and stood perplexed at the doorway. What if her parents, Nightstander and Burns the Meat, weren't asleep? Or worse yet, what if she rejected him and everyone woke up and saw his shame? He looked at his torch, a scanty twist of bark, and wondered if he should trust in Kiss Me's magic. Yet there was something in Laughing Eye's smile and the way she had lingered after the dance that gave him courage. Perhaps it was the wiggle in her walk as she sauntered off. He took a deep breath and stepped inside. At the low embers of the fire pit, he lit his torch and began to grope his way between the sleeping platforms along the walls. He shielded his eyes from the glare with one hand, straining to see her face in the semi-dark. He was reminded of one night during hunting season when they had set a burning brand in the bow of a canoe and drifted downstream watching for the ocular reflection of staring deer along the bank. In his reverie, he thought for a second that he had encountered a curious doe, but it was laughing eyes, peering coyly up at him with an ardent smile. I dreamed you would come, she said, she whispered, lifting his spirits and giving him hope. 
I do not speak from the lips outward, he said softly, but from within. If you are willing, I wish to take you as my wife. You have spoken good words, and my heart is glad, she replied, her eyes sparkling. And with that, she touched his hand, brought his flaming torch to her face, and blew his light out. Thank you. I think we can stop the regular presentation there and, and open up to questions, and I can talk some more about Harmer's Defeat or whatever uh, interests you. Anyone have any uh, questions you'd like to ask? Yeah. Were there, exactly, what were the clans? How, how did that operate? Well, it's fairly complex. I mean, all tribes, and not just in, in America, but apparently among primitive peoples, uh, that you divide into clans. And, and one of the, the rules that seems fairly common around the world is you can't marry within your clan. And so within the village, there would be five, six, eight clans. And, you, and the one, one group you couldn't marry are the people in your specific clan. So that, and they usually had a totem animal of some sort as their defining uh, thing. The, uh, the Miami in general, the Sand Hill Crane was their symbol. And then other, uh, other uh, you know, the Miami originally were six different groups. And a couple of them disappeared. And so we end up, uh, it's my own sense that the Eel River Miami were the, I, I'm not going to pronounce this right, the Kiliatiki Miami. That's not the right, I'd have to see the words to, to pronounce it better. Whereas the, the Sand Hill Crane, and then the Eel River, and then the Wee Indians next down, and then the Pekanasha down in uh, the Vincennes area. And then the, the, the other groups sort of got, got lost in the, in the shuffle. You hear a lot about the, the Wee and the Miami. The Wee were uh, down by Lafayette and Terre Haute and then the Picanasha were down by Vincennes, and then the Miami proper. Uh, the Miami proper was sort of considered the head of the whole thing, but that the, the individual Miami groups was, you know, so the Miami were, had the whole Wabash River in effect. But interestingly, you know, there are three rivers in Ohio named for the Miami. There's the Great Little Miami that go up both sides of Cincinnati, and then the Maumee River is actually another pronunciation of Miami. So. Uh, I hope that helps out, yeah. What does Miami mean? I'm not really sure, that's a good question. I mean, uh, I was talking to a Potawatomi guy down in Vincenzo, you know, and normally the, the, the Indians name for themselves, I mean, if the Miami named themselves, it usually means something like the people. Uh, but if they were named by somebody else, then it can be, you know, the thinking people would like to get away, yeah, get rid of or whatever, you know, that often they, you know, when other people name them, the names can be derogatory. But, but the Indian name for themselves, often, often it means the people. We, we are the people. And I, everyone else is maybe a little less the people than we are the people. Well, they have a place in Florida. In right. I mean, that's one of the curious things. I've asked that often. The, the Miami Florida has absolutely zero to do with the Miami Indians. And why in the world that it name? Just sounded right. Yeah, uh, exactly. I have no idea what the word Miami is doing down there in the tip of Florida because I mean it, it belongs up here in, in Indiana and over in Ohio because the Miami train came all over into Western Ohio at, at one point for sure. Yeah, uh, that was interesting. That one you talked about that Indian hair was a hair. But the legend of all women. Oh, the great right hair. Yeah. Right there by taking yeah. a river woman. Do you think that would have come from some real early missionary? Or was no. That well, you can tell because of the rib business that this is a Miami legend that isn't real because there, there's a Christian ingredient okay. blended into yeah. it. So you, you know that isn't hundreds of years old. You know, yeah. but it, it dates back to probably the 18th century, uh, and, and that's not unusual for the Indians to. You know, obviously the Indians, when the whites came, they began to adopt things. I mean, the, the, the Indians uh, got horses from the Spanish, you know, and yet we always picture the Indians riding horses. There were no horses here. Uh, there were prehistoric horses, but, you know, the, the Plains Indians got horses from, horses that ran away from DeSoto's expedition, uh, who multiplied, and then the Indians adopted them, and so forth, and, and so on. So. Uh, the Indians, you know, would take what what they found useful for sure. They they weren't purists in that sense. Um, 
but obviously the, their, their, their cultures are under enormous stress at this point. So, I mean, I like doing that courtship sequence, which was very hard to put together, because I mean, most of that is actually pretty accurate to uh, at least one type of courtship. There were courtships that were more complex and courtships that were more simple. Um, but down to this business of taking a little torch into the wigwam and waking up the person you were attracted to and sort of letting her know. And, and the words she speaks are, 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 are within the formal things you were supposed to say. I mean, there are other things you could say, but that, that was not just me making stuff up. Um, and if she accepts him, then he would sleep the night. Um, and then if, if your intentions were serious, you would sort of linger around the wigwam until the father woke up in the morning. And, and let him know you slept with his daughter that night. And if your intentions were less than serious, like, I assume you slipped under the, uh, out the back door. Or whatever. But uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of joking there. But, but there was a, an official way you know, to court. You know, if you, if, at least that was one of the courtship methods. And then if the father sort of accepted you, then the parents began to meet and presents were exchanged. And you know, there's a series of steps you go through before you're married, yeah. Well, do you know some of the language of the man? I really don't. It's, it's one of the things, I mean, apparently there's a, there was a, an Indiana guy who wrote an early history of Indiana named Dunn, who made a study of the Miami language. And there's an institute down at Miami University in Ohio where there's a couple Miami-related professors who are working on keeping the language alive. But as far as I know, almost no one anywhere still speaks it. You know, there's a significant Miami presence still in Indiana, down in Peru mainly, is their headquarters. And then there's the Miami Nation out of Oklahoma. So there's two groups of Miami still with us. And in fact, uh, the Miami Nation of Indiana is in a kind of ongoing struggle to get official recognition, as I understand because it. Because what, the white man did? Yeah. Well, because the Oklahoma Miami are the ones that are recognized as the Miami, as I understand. I don't know the in and outs of this. Maybe some of you do. Do you know a little bit more about that? Well, yeah, the, uh, the Indian Miamis that got removed went to Oklahoma. Right. I think they do have federal recognition. Federal right, they definitely do. Federal yeah. recognition gives tribes uh, some uh, prestige, some uh, opportunity for income, finances. Uh, That's right. There's some money help from the grant, yeah. the, from the government. Uh, the Miamis here naturally are resentful because they, they the ones that stayed behind, uh, no longer have a federal recognition. Right. And they've been trying to get it ever since That's right. about yeah. 1803 or something. And I'm, I'm very sorry that Danny isn't here because she's part of Miami yeah. and yeah. could answer this question. But this is ongoing, I know right. that, for the Miamis to try to get recognition here in Indiana. That's right, yeah. There's a famous pianist in right. Fort Wayne. Her, her name is Alicia Pyle. Uh -huh. She's Miami. Oh, that's interesting. And she's tall. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, one thing, uh, Bill, I know that uh, people say, well, why would we want to... There's, there's no Indians left in Indiana. Indiana Land of Indians is right. named after basically the Miami, <laughs> right. Uh, right. Miami County, and uh, that's that's definitely not true. And I want to say that your book disclaims or dispels so many myths too. Yeah. You know, for example, there's a new biography of Red Cloud, a uh, Western Indian. Right. First sentence in the introduction says Red Cloud is the only Indian to defeat the American army. <laughs> totally wrong. Yeah, that's ludicrous. And, and in fact, yeah, Little yeah. Turtle defeated them twice, right. and as Mr. Heath pointed out, in greater numbers than Sitting Bull even. Yeah, I mean, by far. I mean, three times Custer's last stand. And, you know, to put that into perspective, um, there were only five million um, settlers in the country at that time. And so, uh, and now, what, there are 300 million of us. Mm. So d do the math on what 700 people would be in our present numbers. And it's 30 or 40,000 people dead in one day, which, you know, is bigger than any battle of World War II. Uh, so, you know, that, that, that's huge, you know. The, the, uh, and uh, it's inter interesting, you know, uh, this man named Lieutenant Denny brought word of the massacre, brought back to Washington. Washington was at a party, and he went aside into a room, 
And Washington, who sort of prided himself in mastering his strong emotions, mastering his temper, uh, was furious. And he began cussing a blue streak and you know, saying, I warned him about uh, ambush. I said, beware of ambush. You know, and, to blue, you know, and, and he just uh, almost was, uh, I won't try to recreate, but uh, you know, he went into a rant yeah. about what had happened. Uh, and then the next day before the Congress, you know, he, he ameliorated the whole thing. He says, you know, we've suffered a blow, but we could easily replace the man and, uh, you know, not to worry. And, and it, it, he was Mr. Smooth in a way. And one of the great, I mean, I think there's a reason why we don't know about Harmer's defeat. Because Harmer's defeat, St. Clair's defeat, you know, the two together, you know, that's 900 people killed uh, in those two battles. Because, it, you know, it's at least 180. In the, in the Harmer's defeat, and it's at least 700 uh, in St. Clair's defeat. Uh, the reason that's fallen off the, the, the history books is, you know, we want to tell this national narrative of the, the colonists rose up and defeated the greatest military power of, of the time, Great Britain, and our, our great general became our great president, and then it was upward and onward with our great country. Uh, and yet, the truth is that, that Washington had a Vietnam on his hands. You know, and, and I mean, that they suffered incredible defeats. I mean, these are the two big battles, but the, the, the three or four years prior to that, there were a whole series of lesser defeats. And it wasn't until uh, Fallen Timbers in 1794 that the Indians finally uh, backed down. Uh, Wood, for example, says that Harmer's defeat, both sides lost about 200 men each, which makes it a draw. Uh, the Americans lost 180, the Indians lost about 30. That's not a draw. Uh, you know, uh, but you know, th that's, that's yeah. where we are. Or um, when Scott comes up and uh, attacks um, uh, the, the wee village at Lafayette, he reports that we killed 38 uh, people, mainly uh, warriors of stature. Uh, and but I found in the Draper manuscripts an account of somebody who was there and said there were only a few old men and the women and children tried to flee in the canoes and we shot them down. Uh, so that no 38 warriors, 30 people may well have been killed, but maybe six of them were men of stature and the rest were women and children. Uh, but every historian accepts the official report because they haven't dug deeper and found out what actually went on. Uh, and so that, that was, uh, I haven't mentioned the Draper papers. I mentioned all these great resources in the Wisconsin, you know, for the, my other book. But there's this guy named Lyman C. Draper, who was the president of the Wisconsin Historical Society in the early 19th century. And he realized all the pioneers are dying and we're, we're, we're going to lose all that information. And so he devoted his life to traveling the country, interviewing all the surviving pioneers, if they were dead, talking to their sons, if they had any surviving letters, copying them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for 30, 40, 50 years. And the result of this is, is 480 volumes of microfilm uh, with hundreds of pages each, you know, 500 pages per roll, I would say, of all of this source material. No one has ever worked their way through all of this. And it is cataloged, and so you don't have to do it all. But, and of course, old, old men's memories are not always the gospel truth, and that's why you have to sort it out. But there's all of these little nuggets in that stuff that help fill out the picture. And that's one of the ways I could do the courtship, you know, is, is that as I'm going through this, I'm looking for uh, any, anybody <laughs> sleeping with any Indian women or anyone uh, making any mention of courtship practices, et cetera, et cetera. And you, you sort of pull these little things together over the years. And, and you get this little sense, oh, so that's roughly how they did it, uh, and so forth, yeah. I have one, uh, one interesting question here. Um, it's not just the Miami that were dispersed and murdered, and that was just throughout the whole country. All right, now, this is all right across the country this happened for the most part. I mean, I think the Navajo are pretty much the only large tribe that has kept most of its land. Oh, really? Yeah, the, I mean, there's about a third of New Mexico is Navajo. And then inside the Navajo are the Hopi and the Zuni. So that you can go there and actually see Indians in situ, you know, in the same villages they've lived in or the same Pueblos for a thousand years. And some went to uh, Canada. 
Right. Well, in, in the case, yeah, uh, the Iroquois, for example, are right on the Canadian border. So there are Iroquois reservations, small ones here and also in up in Canada. Yeah. Yeah, quick question. You know, like, like say, if, if an individual was a history teacher, let's say in high school. Right. You know, I mean, you know, the bottom line is you can just barely scratch the surface of the history. You know, you, you right. don't really get the small details. And uh, it, it, like me, when, you know, I had not heard of little turtles like came to Willow County 25 years ago. Yeah. But, you know, a little bit off the wall, but what do you, you know, you talk about history and, and everybody's opinion about what really happened. Right. What do you, what do you think about that author, that Zen guy, you know, the one that wrote American history about the really, the way it really happened? The, the who? Howard, Howard Zinn. Zinn. Oh, How, Howard Zinn. Yeah, I mean, Howard Zinn, uh, I mean, his contribution is he called a lot of attention to the underdogs, you know, and, and so he did research on the underside of American history and, and yeah. got some of those people's voices. But I don't think he's a particularly reliable historian. I, I think some of his chapters are much better than others. I think he's good on the early labor movement of the, of the late 19th century yeah. because uh, he, he, he gives us a strong sense of all the people were killed in strikes and you know, how brutal it was in effect. But you know, he's not very good on the Indians, for example, and uh, you know, his axes are grind. He's, he's a little too locked into uh, political positions ahead of time. Uh, and, and you know, my sympathies are, are with the left, but he's too locked into certain biased notions about what, what went on, I think, and, and that skews his treatment. Uh, I think, you know, you could teach that text in high school provided you didn't take it straight. You know, if yeah. you could say, here's where he has it wrong. I mean, if you could play against the text. But uh, th that, that text has another set of problems where some of the official histories, which are a little too pompous, a little too much great men, they have another set of problems, you know. And, uh, I, when I used to teach uh, my American Experience course, I, I kept looking for a history text that really pleased me, and I could not find one, you know. I mean, I, I would like this and not that and so forth. Uh, it, it's very hard to write big overview general histories, I think, just real tricky. Uh, and then there's a, Oliver Stone has just brought one out that yeah. sounds even more off the wall than the Howard Zinn one. The Howard Zinn one, you know, has its moments. He, he, he wrote very well about the Civil Rights Movement. I mean, in fact, I, uh, he has an early book called The New Abolitionist yeah. about Bob Moses and those people. I think that's a much better book as a book than, this, than his big overview, which, it, you know, it, it's, it's curious how some books go super popular. And not always for the best reasons. Well, I'll make a long story short. You know, I'll read about anything, but it was kind of comical about a year ago. Our glorious last governor, you know, this, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, Mitch. 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 Mitch Daniels. Mitch, Mitch, Mitch after, Daniels. After he got himself appointed to the uh, president right. of Purdue University, yeah. you know, he thought one of his first, you know, official acts would be to ban this book. Oh dear. Yeah. Yeah. So no, that's. I mean, that's. It, it's not <laughs> that bad by any stretch. Yeah. Uh, but that's ludicrous. I mean. Uh, yeah. yeah. That makes no sense at all. But you know, it, 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 he's not a great. You know, he's not the last word either. You know, yeah. I mean, if uh, I think it's a, it's a book worth reading, but don't think you now know it all. You know, yeah. but but you're probably more aware of the underside of certain things than the other books. Uh, we probably should wrap it up. But another question. I asked, uh, well, first of all, I want to say uh, if William Wells hadn't switched sides, I don't think Fort Wayne would be named Fort Wayne. <laughs> I don't think that anyway. Well, you know, I mean, he, got all the he played a, a huge role, and um, there, there were times, I mean, when Anthony Wayne marched, Little Turtle was no longer in charge, it was Blue Jacket, and Blue Jacket was more under the influence of the British than Little Turtle was, and I think it was the British that convinced Blue Jacket to use the fallen timbers, because that looks like a good defense because you've got fallen timbers and it's like a mini fort. But the problem is, as I said before, the Indians' way of fighting was to do a, a power attack at one point and break the lines and then circle. They call it the half moon formation. And in fallen timbers, you've got this, uh, you've got a river on one side and then very heavy standing timber over here and then the fallen timber in here. And that meant the Indians couldn't maneuver. The Indians didn't stand in place and fight. That they 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 fired and moved, you know, and 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 they encircled, and and fallen timbers made them stay in place, 
And Wayne's big thing was bayonet charges. You know, and so here come 2,000 guys at you, and, and uh, you've only got a few hundred Indians who are in place. And of course they broke and ran. Uh, so, I mean, that's what, but anyway, uh, the point I was going to make is that even though Wayne's army was in general better trained and they had better scouts, when you're marching 2,000, 3,000 people up through the wilderness, you have to picture what a wilderness was from the Ohio River, you know, all the way up to here. Uh, it's rough terrain, I and mean, the terrain itself can chew you up in those days. Uh, you get strung out, you know, and, and so had uh, Blue Jacket been able to pick a good spot, I think they could have picked off the, the Legion and sort of rolled them up uh, in, in, in series, you know. I mean, I, I think they were vulnerable on given days, but of course, it's very hard to know <laughs> what those days are going to be and so forth. And Wells and his scouts are out there making it doubly difficult. But I think Wayne's army could have been beaten too if the Indians had picked the, the perfect spot to do it. With all the timbers on the Maumee, you it, mentioned it's the Maumee. It's right by Toledo on the Maumee, on the, on the north so, bank so of the Maumee. The Maumee played a pretty big role then in the Miami Conflict right, that there was a lot of Indian villages along the Maumee, uh, from Fort Wayne all the way up to Lake Erie. The, uh, not just the Miami, but the Wyandotte were up there. And uh, as the Shawnee got pushed away from their villages down in central Ohio, they moved up there. The Delaware got pushed from eastern Ohio, all the way well, from Delaware, you know, Pennsylvania, to eastern Ohio. They were up there. Uh, and then the Delaware moved down to White River here in Indiana. So, yeah. If you go there, the, the place where the monument is and the place right by the river is not where the fight took place. That's right. Th that, uh, it's on the other side of the 24, right. and, and yeah. they own it now, the state does, but you kind of got to get a guide and go through. And, 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 and there's a big mall sitting on a big part of the battlefield right. now. Uh, but the, 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 a professor from uh, Heidelberg, I believe, went That's through with a, mine, with a metal detector and located where the actual, most of the fighting took place. Yeah, mo mo those the the battle, what looks like the battlefield is, is not where the battlefield was. Right, uh, at least where, they, where the marker is, you're right, that's right. not the place. And the only place I disagree with that historian is he thinks all the fight took place up on the bluff above the river. And I'm pretty sure that there was some fighting down in the thicket by the river as well. That wasn't the major fight, but there were definitely some Indians and some troops down in, in that train. That's my only <laughs> quarrel with that. But, but you know, he, he did keep, you know, that's what I'd love someone to do with Harmer's Defeat. I'd love someone with ground seeking equipment or, uh, I don't know, is there equipment now that can identify where there are skulls, where there are bones? Probably. But if someone would, would scout them, I have maps up here if anyone's curious, I can show you the exact location uh, where uh, you might look. But, uh, <laughs> You know, the key thing here is, uh, I, I went out yesterday and talked to farmers in the area, and of course they come up with arrowheads like that. <coughs> but the key thing is anyone's coming up with buttons or a rusted bayonet or something to indicate the presence of U.S. troops. That, and, and best of all, worst of all, is a bunch of skulls. Mm -hmm. And needless to say, those skulls would have a, a nice little crack in the top where they yeah. were tomahawked. You know? So it wouldn't be hard to tell if you found a massacre. Yeah. When they just laid on the ground and animals to see them up, right? Well, now. yeah, but not all the bones disappear and so forth, you know. But, you know, obviously, and the Indians would have stripped the body, so it's, it's not like they're all going to be neatly in position. But I think it's possible, you know, to, to find some stuff if, if you know where to look close enough. But you're, you're right, you know, needle and haystack kind of thing, but, but not impossible. And yeah. When people farmed and cleared, if they found it, wouldn't they dish? Well, yeah, they're not looking for it, you know, and so that, I mean, that makes it doubly hard. And yet, one of the things I, I learned today is that the farmers have actually moved the Eel River in that immediate area. They covered over the old river and, and dug a new channel for more farmland. But there's, I, I walked back to one of the little valleys where the Eel River used to be. And uh, I walked back with this 14-year-old boy and said, oh, I found stuff. You know, 14-year-old uh, yeah. boys, you can't always believe. But, you know, he was saying, I found a horseshoe, and I found this, and I found that. Uh, but they're all gone now. But it, it's not Im impossible, I think, to find enough stuff to... Because once you find a couple things, then you can bring in 
the heavy duty equipment and, and see if you're, you're on target. Um, anyway, I, I think it's this important battle and, and it'd be good to have a marker that lets us know just where it was. Yeah. But don't you think that the, after the battle, when people have been grabbing anything they could get? Well, you know, in those days, you know, that, that no one else, is, no one's there. You know, it's, it's not like the people, the neighbors come and grab. That there's, it's, but, it's wilderness. The Indians are going to strip the bodies. But wouldn't they take anything that's useful, metal or anything? Right, most things. But you know, if you've got sixty dead bodies, there's still buttons yeah, and but, all. There's all kinds of things that you know in Gettysburg, you know, they're still but, finding stuff to this day. But, right. But, at that time, that was stuff that if it was shiny, they took it. Well, they sure, you know, I mean, obviously we're talking 99% is gone, but you, you're never going to get it all. And and not all bodies are, you know, these people are running, some of them are dying in the woods without people knowing where they fell. And Let's build on top of that now. Well, you know, I mean, I agree, this is hard, but it's not impossible. You know, I mean, if, if you have a, a, your right terrain. It's farmland. Yeah. yeah, it's it's mainly farmland. It's, it's yeah. not it's not how, it's not developed. There aren't any houses. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I can show, you know if you're curious, I'll yeah. show you the region. Yeah. 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 I just want to know, would you do uh, uh, like a network of uh, uh, research and call of the Americans here in the whole region? No, that's way beyond my <laughs> my scope. <laughs> right, oh yeah, but that's, you know, I'm not up to doing that. Uh, I'm going to offer my book set 33% uh, off, and I'd be happy to sign copies. So Black Snake's Path that normally sells for 30, you got to sell for 20, and uh, this one sells for 15, normally for 10, and uh, can someone do 33? This would be 18, I guess. So, uh, and I'd be happy to sign copies. So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.